Well, hello, everybody. Um, welcome to Politics, Polarization, and the Pandemic, which media sources can you trust? Uh, my name is Bob Berkman, and I am the business librarian here at the University of Rochester. Uh, my colleagues and I will provide a full introduction in a minute, um, but we'd like to preface today's event with a bit of background about what spurred us to develop this, this program and what our goals are for today. So obviously problems with misinformation, digital propaganda, and algorithmically driven social media have been widely discussed over the last few years. But in the past year, the stakes of being misled by bad information have become quite a bit higher, literally a matter of life or death. Um, so as media and information professionals, we felt it was vital to make a contribution in some way. Um, and we did so by sharing our skills and experiences on how to identify and assess the credibility of your media and information sources. So we'll be covering a lot of ground in this hour, expertise and scientific consensus, media bias and trust, information evaluation techniques, understanding data and data visualization and more. Um, we're also building in a few interactive elements like the one uh, you just participated in to engage you more directly. But don't worry about keeping track of everything you see necessarily. We'll provide everyone uh, with a link to all of the links, tools, resources uh, that we share today in a single document. Um, our goal is that after today's session, you'll all come away with at least one new insight, strategy, or tool that you could call on yourself for yourself or somebody that um, you think needs your assistance. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping uh, guidelines for today I'd like to pass along. Um, one is we do have an interpreter here for those uh, of us in the deaf community that need some assistance here and to help um, uh, the, um, those people that do need uh, the interpreter's assistance, we'd ask you to keep your video off uh, during this time. Um, uh, we're also recording this session, so just so you know what we're doing. Also, there is a University of Rochester Times reporter here reporting on this event as well. And finally, um, if you've not done so already, uh, please also mute yourself and also hold questions till the end. Uh, we will have time for, the, for questions at the end. So now on to our event. So uh, again, uh, I am the business librarian at the University of Rochester. I also have a background in journalism. Uh, uh, and um, I'm also the editor of a, of a journal that I started many years ago called the Information Advisor's Guide to Internet Research. And my presentation will be primarily about expertise, media, and trust. Hey guys, uh, I'm Kristana Texter. I'm an instructor uh, in the Digital Media Studies program here, and I am going to be leading us through an activity called Spot the Troll. Um, I study games and learning, so we're going to have a playful uh, interaction with a tool, uh, and I, I believe that people learn through play, so that's what I'm hoping happens today. Hi everyone, I'm Stephanie Barrett. I'm a social science librarian at the University of Rochester, and one of the subject areas I cover is public health. Today I'm going to be going over uh, the SIFT framework to um, try to figure out how you can interrogate your sources. And um, hi everyone, my name is Sarah Pugachev. I'm director of the uh, Science and Engineering Libraries um, here on River Campus and Research Initiatives. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about data because it seems to be everywhere when we're reading about COVID. Okay, so I will kick things off here with my presentation now. And let me just get here. All right, um, thumbs up. You can see a new screen here, the state of COVID missing. Okay, great. All right, so let's just start by looking at the overall landscape today. And I really like the way this chart kind of, uh, it, it, the chart here is published by the Foreign Policy Research uh, Organization. And it, it lays out the various entities that are really trying to provide us with bad information. Um, and there's a lot here uh, and I won't go into it, but I do, we will include the link to this, to this chart in our resource pack. But you can just get a sense by just quickly scanning about all the different types of uh, entities that are really trying to, um, fool us basically, and specifically about COVID. Uh, and tactics now do include uh, referencing that, that quote on our initial uh, screen there, that the most effective misinformation includes a kernel of truth. They, there is more strategies now of mixing in um, true with false information. There's also trolls as we'll talk about later, uh, which are automated social media accounts that pretend to be actual people, and a whole variety of entities that are really sort of working against 
Um, also, uh, sadly, there is one other source that is also becoming more difficult to trust, and uh, that is um, our own government. Um, so uh, you can tell by some of these headlines that have been in the news recently, and that really is too bad, obviously, an understatement to say the least. So as these falsehoods are being disseminated um, through traditional and social media, let's take a look at our media ecosphere and begin with asking which news sources can you fully trust, okay? All right, so which news source can you fully trust? And I've actually compiled a list here. And that's the list. And the list is empty because there's really no such thing as a source that you can really totally trust, all right? Um, now, at the same time, uh, we can look at how sources do compare on a spectrum. Uh, uh, I very much like, and some of you may have come across this now, it's become quite well known uh, that um, there's a, a, a patent attorney in Colorado who created this media bias chart. And uh, it's actually um, not just randomly placed. You can see there's a left and right axis from most left to most right. And there's also an up and down axis for original fact reporting, uh, complex analysis and inaccurate and fabricated information. And different sources are placed on this chart. Um, and as you can see, CNN, you know, is considered fact reporting and analysis and skews left. Forbes is a little bit to the to the right here. And um, you can take a look at your own uh, sources. And we also include, if you're not familiar with um, with this site, we also include a link to this media bias chart chart in our resource pack as well. And we'll be coming back to this later in our session. Um, you know, and just to keep in mind, this is not a written in stone. This is not the ultimate answer, of course, but it is actually a pretty rigorous methodology if you go to site to see how they come up with this. And it, it's a great discussion starter as well. But the main point is we can see that all our sources, and this doesn't include social media per se, we're talking about that later. Um, you know, we, we're, they're based on, um, uh, we're all gonna get different perspectives based on what we choose to follow. Now, of course, in addition, uh, we also bring our own perspective. We're, own, we're also biased ourselves. Um, we have our own values and worldview, of course. And of course, it's good to have these. You don't want to give them up because um, uh, that leads to action. And we don't, um, you know, we don't want to give that up. But we don't want necessarily our feelings to interfere with our ability to accept credible information, especially about, about health. And we don't want it to interfere with us having an accurate view of reality. Many of you have probably heard the term information bubble now, and um, and that really refers to um, how, especially on social media, we're just seeing posts um, from people that are like us, or that the algorithms have determined we want to see because they're like us. And you know, key is getting out of the out of the bubble. Bu bubble uh, and there's some good work being done uh, on this right now. And there are some resources that I'm listing uh, in the resource package. One is called Beyond Your Bubble. It just came out this year and is actually published by the American Psychological Association. Uh, quite interesting. So, uh, so we're dealing with our own, our own natural ways of, of looking at things, what are called motivated reasoning. We naturally want to believe things. This is not, become, this is not new news anymore. But we want to believe things that already agree with us. Uh, you know, the internet has really put confirmation bias around, around a long time on steroids, so to speak. So, but while our own internal biases can't easily be avoided, it's not correct to say that all media sources are equally credible and are equally successful um, in, uh, uh, in their attempt to be fair and, and informative. Uh, some are more credible than others, and that's particularly true when it comes to news about science. One big problem though today uh, is that the concept of expertise is under attack, uh, both in the general pop population and by our political leaders. Uh, here's just a few quotes recently that uh, are by world leaders about, about experts and pretty much disparaging experts and expertise. And there's an excellent book that I'd recommend called um, The Death of, of Expertise too that you may want to take a look at as well. So the reasons, why, why are we having this? That's another very complex topic that could probably easily be another hour session, but uh, why are we not trusting expertise anymore? There's, uh, there's several things that work here. There's a confusion because there's a, a movement against elitism uh, and there's a confusion between elitism and expertise. Of course they can overlap, but they're different things. Um, there's a rise in popularity of non-credentialed authority on the internet as well. Um, so you have, you have different people who, who do get a following and, and are claimed to be authority. And there's there more recently, there's some just really interesting discussion about the problems of the fact that we have a meritocracy. Those are the most education, 
uh, in our society rise to the top with the best jobs, and that can leave people behind. And then there's a distrust between that gap. And the pandemic has sort of just been widening that divide. Um, and it's doing so to the point where even accepted research on a ba as basic a matter as wearing masks has become politicized. Um, there's a, a Dunkin' Donuts around the corner from uh, where I, I live. And um, a person serving uh, my coffee was wearing a mask when I just went in just a couple of days ago. But it said this, formed by fo force, not by fear. Um, this message really conveys a clear misunderstanding. Uh, and this is a, the way I was able to get an image of this is apparently this is a thing. There, you can go on Amazon and get this. Um, purpose of mass primarily to avoid. The purpose of mass is primarily to avoid infecting others. Um, that's the first misconception here. Furthermore, even if one is wearing it to protect oneself as well, because there's evidence of that as well, it's not an indicator of fear, just like not putting on a seatbelt or not having a drink when you're about to go driving is not about fear, but what the best evidence is telling us about public and personal safety. Uh, and it's particularly hazardous to ignore experts in the matter of science, but there is confusion here. Uh, some will complain that the scientists have changed their advice to the public and not been consistent. And that has to lead us to a discussion of the matter of scientific consensus and how to think about it when talking about information about the pandemic. And it's really good, uh, this very simplified view here, but it's a good way to sort of think about how scientific consensus involves. And um, looking on the, um, on the circle on the right, we can just understand that scientific method is a process. There's observations, there's testing hypotheses, we predict, we refine and alter, uh, excuse me, um, our hypotheses and so forth. And eventually there's predictions are made. So, um, and then we come to what's called cons scientific consensus. And the problem right now, of course, is that with COVID, the scientific process of learning, testing and revising is going on right in front of us. We usually don't get that opportunity. So what appears to be wrong at any moment because something's been revised is really just watching the scientific process uh, underfold. And at some point, hopefully we'll get to that scientific consensus as there is about so many areas such as human induced climate change and other areas. So we have to keep that in mind as well about why, why there's this confusion. But back to our original question, which news sources are better at giving you good information to make you more knowledgeable? Well, first let's say which ones are less likely to be the ones you'd want to trust for your information about COVID. And here we'd have to really cite first of all, is your own social media feed. And of course, you know, um, it's here where you're gonna get those posts that are designed to spark anger, outrage, and fear uh, done by often by entities and people that don't have your interests in mind, but some agenda that they have. We're getting headlines and very short clips, uh, bits of pieces on very complex matters that you really need to get better context on. And of course, the fact that we're living in what's called an attention economy uh, where the bigger the commodity for anyone, uh, a company, a government, or any entity is how to capture our, our attention. I just came across uh, on Twitter, which can be a good source if you follow trusted experts and, and, and people are authorities in the field. Um, so you have to be selective in who you follow. The a union of reporters uh, in California was circulating a petition against the Sacramento Bee, which had just determined that all the reporters will now be paid and incentivized by the click how many stories are clicked on. That's actually not a good ethical stance for a journalist to take in deciding what to report and how to report. So the other issue is why do we share posts? I'd like to just ask you very quickly in the chat, why do you think we share posts? Just in one or two words or a sense at most, why do you think we share our posts on social media to our connections? You just can put that into chat now. I can't tell in mine. Do we have uh, Sarah or Krishna? Do you see any chats coming in? If you would, yeah, mind. I'm happy to read some. Just of read them. a few off, if you could. Yeah, so I'm seeing for attention to promote our own beliefs, spread word, um, something about proving our self importance, <clears throat> uh, to share to our connections and foreign friends and family, uh, scoop wanting to find out, uh, wanting to find people who share your beliefs, connecting. Uh, FOMO, which is fear of missing out. If you're not familiar with that, I like that one. Um, so how I feel, what others think that might want the information to justify our own opinions. Um, and a few more is uh, because we support the message and we want to send it forward or because we disagree and we want to present our counter argument. Okay. 
responses there. All right, thank you so much. And those are all, I'm sure, very true. Um, but there is actually some really good research on this. this is, uh, um, MIT uh, researcher and scientist, her name is Judith Donath. She wrote this uh, book called The Social Machine. She's done other work. And her research is the main reason we share on social media is for social bonding. We, uh, have, a, we have an in-group that we feel connected to. And when we share something that outrages us or says, hey, can you believe this? Look at this. It's a way to create a social bonding with, uh, hey, we're all in this together. It's usually something negative. It can be something positive. And so, um, you know, we can, uh, going back to our bubble, we can really kind of accelerate the power of that bubble when we share because it's a very human, very basic nature to, to want to bond with those. So that, that's great to do social bonding, but when we're using it to say this is information that you should believe, there may be occasionally some conflicts there. So social media, not so great, uh, but, you know, not terrible not the worst thing if you do it well, but generally it has some problems. So what should we look for instead? So um, finally, I'd say it is for sources that meet these criteria. What is its mission? Is it to primarily to inform? Um, are the articles deeply researched? Do they provide context? Do they answer the why questions? Do they cite evidence, reports, surveys, quotations? Um, do they have a proven track record? And finally, can you say after you read something, did it lead to insight, some new insight, understanding, and more questions. I'll share what I think my, what I turn to, my own personal trusted sources, just my own. I love The Economist magazine. I think they do a great job. The PBS NewsHour, The Atlantic magazine, The Wall Street Journal, The News, not the editorial, which are two different worlds. To me, they meet those criteria as well or better than any others. Finally, um, there's one more source that I do advise that everybody trust, uh, no matter what. And this is a source that has only one mission. It is to provide you with the reliable and trusted and credible information that is just designed to what you need, actually. And this source does not get paid by the click, does not need to turn a profit, has no real agenda, again, other than to help you find excellent information, okay? And that is the librarian. And it's not just us saying it because uh, we're generally librarians here. But it, it is it, what I always said is true, keep it in mind. And actually surveys like Pew and others have shown that librarians and libraries are in fact one of the last truly trusted professionals uh, in our society when we're living in a world of, of distrust. So um, now we're gonna do something slightly different. We're gonna go back to that um, uh, media chart, but we've got a little something different to show you uh, about it. Uh, while I've been talking in the background, my colleague Stephanie has actually been inputting all the sources that you just entered early into the um, into the interactive media chart. Right now, Stephanie, we're seeing you know the um, the original um, items you entered. Right. Yeah, I just wanted to show, um, especially the people who came in late. We did a little word cloud asking about what sources people uh, check to find COVID news. So this was the uh, the original poll, and I entered um, some of the sources into the media bias chart. It's kind of cool. It has an interactive element to it. So um, here you go, Bob. Take it away. Can you just make it slightly larger on your side? If that's sure. well, if not, it's not a big deal. It might make it a little easier to, to look at it. We can be a little bigger. Thanks. So uh, interestingly, what we see here is that, okay, NPR, these are the ones that are listed the most. NPR is seen as uh, fact reporting and slightly skews to the left. The Wall Street Journal came out quite a bit, fact reporting slightly skews to the right. Huffington Post came up often, skews more to the left and is a complex analysis uh, or a mix of fact and reporting. The Economist, the New York Times is right here, a little bit on the left, down here, had the Fox News, which is uh, considered hyper-partisan right and is opinion or high variation reliability. Um, so uh, what's fun about this chart too, is that in your pack, you, we also have a link where you can actually enter sources yourself and see where they land. And um, as I say, uh, I think this is a very good uh, resource. Of course, anything can be discussed and debated these days, but it's as good as one that we've come across. So. Um, <laughs> So thank you. And now we're going to move along to our next um, presentation, which is by my colleague, Kristana. 
All right, guys. Um, so what we are going to be doing is playing a little game, and that is Spot the Troll. Can everybody see my screen okay right there? Okay, excellent. Um, and I think Sarah is going to be pumping in some uh, things to the chat. So um, we're actually going to be playing it not through the link, but um, together um, here on the screen. And we've got a, a little polling feature. So be prepared to answer yes or no um, when it pops up on your screen. And then I will um, guide us through uh, Spot the Troll. So Spot the Troll is a game that was designed by Clemson University. Um, and it is designed to help people better identify uh, what things um, they can, uh, what they, what logic they need to use in order to spot a fake media account. So a troll is a fake social media account, often created to spread misleading information. All right. So we're going to go right in through here. We've got eight profiles, and we're going to start with Chloe Evans. So I want you to put on your detective hats and guess: is Chloe a troll or not? All right. So we've got Chloe's profile. Uh, it looks like it is a Twitter profile. She's got a cute photo. She's got a background of a ski hill. She's a student from Atlanta. She's joined in uh, June 2014. Hmm. This is all going to hell, dead horse. Okay, that's interesting. Don't know that one. Who's responsible for the dead horse? Obama. Okay, chemical accident, Louisiana. This is interesting. Okay, just giving you a chance to look at this for a second. Here we go. She's got a couple of quotes. Hashtag true. Hmm. All right. Obviously, another hashtag true. All right. Okay. So let's see for polls. I'm going to launch this. Uh, da, 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 da. Actually, Bob, can you, yeah, would you launch the poll for me, please? Sure. For us, please. It should pop up on your screen. So we're going to vote Is this a troll or no? Vote yes or no here. And I can see the results coming in pretty quickly. We've got 28, 29, 30 people saying she's a troll, six people saying she's not. All right, and it looks like we've got, people are still voting. Okay, and I think we're going to go ahead, we'll close the poll now and go ahead and I think I can share the results. Can you guys see the results on screen? So yeah, mostly majority here of folks voted that it's a troll. So what do we say? We're gonna say it's a troll. Okay, and here it is. Yes, correct. So the game is telling us, yes, we found this. How do we know? Chloe was a Russian made troll account, right? Um, she was part of the Internet Research Agency. Um, I think Sarah's going to put that link up in the chat. Um, how do we know? Well, we can click on our full analysis here for Chloe. Um, there are, she published hoax events that never happened, right? So like the dead horse thing with the chemical accident in Louisiana was very bizarre. Um, she, uh, they used a stolen image um, for her profile. Um, much like Chloe, they typically use profile images of attractive young, young women, right? Um, common tactic of charlatans, da, da 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 Okay, so Chloe is a bona fide troll. Okay, and we know that, right? So here we go, and we're gonna go back to the quiz and we'll go here. Um, and I actually wanna take you to Christopher Warwick. All right, so here is Christopher Warwick. This is his profile, right? We've got a photo of him and his family. He lives in Columbia City, Indiana. Um, here are some of the things that he has been sharing off of this account. This is why you don't step on the flag. So obviously he's got a patriotic streak here. Um, he's sharing his meme, right? Florida for Warriors. He's got a pro Chick-fil-A honoring fallen soldiers on Memorial Day, um, another meme. Right, okay, so he's sharing that. I'm thinking he's a troll or not? Let's think about that. Bob, I think you can launch the poll now to vote if he is troll or no. There he is. Okay, there's another meme he's been showing, right? Okay, so this is an image here, pray for the world. Hashtag coronavirus, okay. Don't forget about this place for lunch. He's got some a local spot here with the Columbia Lit Locker. Uh, and an ad for some barbecue pulled pork. What do people think? Is this is this gentleman, is Chris Warwick, is he a troll or not? What do we think? What do we think? All right, we've got results coming in. It looks like about 82% of folks are saying no, 18 are saying yes. And go ahead and publish those results if you want there, Bob. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, so we're gonna say no, he's not a troll, he's legit. Right, and what do we see? Correct. 
right? So this is an actual actual human being and person. How do we know? Because um, they uh, they go into the details of he's published local local information. He's got photos of his family. It's more than just a political account that's pushing things out, right? Okay, we're going to go to one last one, and I want to show. We're going to go to Amy G right here. Okay, Amy G, spot the troll. Is she on her Twitter profile? Do we think she's a troll or not? No bad vibes. Here's a photo. She's a daughter, a sister, a proud Black American. She tends to get political. That's right up there in the front. Okay, quite a few followers. Okay, so she looks like she's a little left leaning. Here we go. Don't have to say anything to the haters. Do not have to acknowledge them at all. It's a pro Michelle Obama. Okay, here we go. Go ahead and launch the poll, Bob. People are probably already thinking, is she a troll or not? Amy G. Is Amy G a troll? Okay, right? Anti-Trump tweet here. And here we go. Ah, this is very interesting. This is this is split more 50-50 than any other ones that we've seen. Okay. That's right, man. Okay, we've got a Roger Stone post. Okay. Here we go. Here's another, here's a um, another tweet from her about a girl at a mental health facility. Okay. All right. I think the results are in. Go ahead and show the results. Is it a, is she a troll or no? Wow. Wow. Okay. Very, very tight race on this, but it looks like she uh, is legit according to our votes. Is she legit? She is not. This was a troll account. Okay. Um, so like the previous right-leaning Twitter account, we identified Amy as a Russian troll and worked with Twitter to suspend the account. Um, so it's it's a common tactic. They say that she pretends to be a left-leaning black woman, a common tactic. Um, she engages with the black community. But you'll notice, and you can click on the further analysis um, at your own leisure and go through the rest of this game. Um, uh, on your own, um, you'll notice that she doesn't have any personal information um, and it's just really uh, chaotic meme spreading, right? So that's another tip. Um, highly recommend this game. Uh, it works for a wide variety of audiences. I've used it with undergraduates. I've used it with colleagues. Um, I've used it with family members. Um, and it's a really great uh, starting point for a discussion about fake media accounts and um, being more aware of these types of things. So that is Spot the Troll and our little game for today. So I will stop that and hand it off. And I think, Stephanie, I think you're the next up off of that after that. It'd help if I unmuted myself. Okay, so let me get my PowerPoint started. Out of the way. All right. So at this point, we can see that this world of digital information we navigate each day is extremely complex. It's important to identify credible sources, but we also need to be able to identify false information when we come across it. Whether it's directly from news sources or from social media, where the spread of false information has really become endemic. So this graphic comes from Consumer Reports. They analyze misinformation policies from the country's biggest social media platforms. After their analysis, these researchers went back to the platforms and most of them agreed with what was found. We can see here that the policies regarding health and the coronavirus from five of the eight platforms do allow for some false information to make it through to their users. And it's not just the ability to spread false information that's the issue. In 2018, researchers at MIT looked at more than 126,000 stories that were tweeted millions of times between 2006 and the end of 2016. They found that false information spreads much faster. A false story would reach Twitter users six times faster than a news story over the same time period. False information also has a much greater reach than true news, reaching 35% more people. This phenomenon goes back to what Bob alluded to earlier about our internal biases and how these can result in filter bubbles and echo chambers. But when it comes to false information, what exactly are we talking about? 
This figure shows the three main facets of information disorder. Misinformation and disinformation are about things not being true. While the main purpose of disinformation and malinformation is to harm a specific person or group. Today, we're focusing on the falseness aspect um, of disinformation and misinformation, which the line can get kind of blurry between those two. Um, if people don't take the time to check the veracity of their sources, they can easily spread disinformation without intending to cause harm. When it comes to COVID-19, disinformation has become its own kind of pandemic. Actually, memory, many people are actually calling this an infodemic. This is a screenshot of something I personally received through Facebook Messenger in mid-March, right before the University of Rochester closed down. But even then, I knew how untrue and dangerous this was. The person who sent it to me trusted their source because they worked in healthcare, albeit they were not a doctor or a nurse. Over the past couple of months, reports have been published by researchers across many of our top institutions regarding false information beliefs and how they spread. These reports are data heavy, so I'm not going to get into them too much today. But one of the most surprising things I found was that many people in the age group of 18 to 24 believe that only people older than 60 are, older, are at risk for coronavirus. If you want to dive more into these reports, there's a link in the chat that will also be included in the resources we'll be sharing out with you all. And then there are other forces at play. This recently published study by Cornell founded that our head of state has been the single largest driver of misinformation when it comes to coronavirus. It's a pretty interesting study where the researchers aggregated print, broadcasts, and online news from the first half of this year. Then they parsed out specific false information topics like miracle cures and deep state conspiracy theories. So with all of this going on, how can we fight the spread of false information and determine sources we come across are actually credible? This brings me to SIFT, which is a framework created by Michael Caulfield, um, who is with Washington State University at Vancouver. SIFT is an incredibly simple, quick, and realistic way to vet the sources that you come across. The first part of SIFT is to just stop, take a breath, and take an Take a moment before you do anything else. Check your reaction. Is it sudden and emotional? If so, that should be a red light that someone or some group might be trying to manipulate you. Maybe they want to sow discord in our society. Maybe they want to influence how you will vote. Maybe it's not a bad actor at all and the person sharing this information honestly thinks that what they're sharing is true. You need to reevaluate the information you're looking at. Ask yourself if you're certain the information is true or do you just want it to be true? And do not repost or share until you know it's true and that you're not making a decision based on something like motivated reasoning. Here's a real life example of why you need to stop before you react. Dr. Mike Mendoza is the public health commissioner of Monroe County and is one of the most visible people creating the policies to fight against COVID-19 in Rochester. He has a Twitter account shown on the left. However, someone created a phony or troll account pictured on the right. This troll account has posted hundreds of tweets, often undermining and confusing the efforts of public health officials. The first time I saw a post by this fake user, I had no idea that I was looking at a troll account. That is until I looked at his Twitter handle, which I don't know if you can see that, but it's uh, Dr. Mendonuts, which is kind of funny. Um, but anyway, this account was recently suspended by Twitter, but it's unknown how much damage this account has inflicted by people believing um, what the troll account has posted and then no longer trusting what our public health officials are saying. The next step in SIFT is to investigate the source. Who created the information that you're looking at? Look into who is behind the post and think about why they might be posting that information. Try looking in Wikipedia or on a fact checking site for the name, company, organization, study, or publisher. 
learn about the expertise and education of the creator and think about what their agenda might be. This is a study that was conducted by researchers at Stanford who asked three groups of people to look at live websites and determine if they were credible or not. Though this isn't COVID-19 specific, it really shows how hard it can be to distinguish what is reliable information and how people of different backgrounds investigate sources. Here are two of the organizations that were compared in the study. If you Google these organizations, you'd see that the American Academy of Pediatrics, the one on the left, is one of the largest publishers of clinical pediatric information in the world and is a long trusted source. On the other hand, the American College of Pediatricians, the one on the right, is a con conservative advocacy group that was formed um, solely in protests against the adoption of children by gay couples. The three groups in the study were comprised of fact checkers, historians, and undergraduate college students. Only one of these groups was able to tell 100% that the American Academy of Pediatrics was a more credible source. And that was the fact checkers. They knew you couldn't look at what an organization says about itself on its website, but you need to look and see what other sources are saying about it. That's where the title of this study comes from. The fact checkers did not read vertically by staying on the same web page. They read laterally by immediately leaving those websites and looking up who those organizations are. The next part of SIFT is to find better coverage. If checking the source brings you to a questionable place, try looking in other more reliable sources for information. Use the media bias chart to double check where the source falls. You should also look beyond the first results and check in a few different places. If the information shows up in several reliable places, it is very likely accurate. You can also use fact-checking sites like Snopes or do a reverse um, image search. So for a moment, let's go back to this image that was shared with me on Facebook Messenger. I did a reverse image search and found that this information was quickly debunked by numerous sources. But I also looked this up on Snopes and found that this is, which is a reliable fact checking site, they determined that gargling with salt water to kill COVID-19 is indeed a false claim. The last part of SIFT is to trace what a source is saying back to the original content. Too often the context of the original information is lost and a key aspect might be left out or the details not fully explained. Back in May and June, there were many headlines of the vaccine being ready soon. My husband told me his colleagues were saying emphatically that there would be a vaccine ready in September. This set off a red flag for me, being somewhat familiar with the phase trials that the vaccine would need to go through. So I trace these headlines back to the original release from the Oxford Research Group. September was never specifically mentioned. Rather, they referenced that the vaccine may be ready in autumn and that this time frame is highly ambitious and subject to change. While the information from the other news source, they weren't exactly false. However, they really weren't telling the entire story. So now I'm going to hand over the reins to Sarah, who's going to talk about data and how to make sense of everything. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, I will share my screen really quickly. Here we go. And make sure that I have it actually presenting. Okay. Um, can you give me a thumbs up if you see my screen in the correct way right now? Excellent. It's always hard to tell. So um, I'm going to talk a little bit about data. What Stephanie just said about SIF can absolutely be applied to data, and I think it should be applied to data. So um, I'm going to start with a little bit of definition. So I think many of us are familiar with the concept of literacy. So, and I know librarians like to talk about various literacies. So um, for me, that means the ability to read and write, but not just read and write, but to think 
um, critically about what we're reading to read for knowledge, write coherently. And I'm using this definition right now from the Data Journalism Handbook. We'll put a link to that in the chat. It's a great resource, but we can apply the same concept to data. So data literacy is not the ability to see and recognize data. It's the ability to understand it, to consume it for knowledge and to think critically, perhaps use that SIF framework when you're encountering data. So how can we do that? What questions can we specifically ask about data that we see? Um, I think most, most news articles about COVID have some piece of data or they link to data or they mention data. So here are some things I ask myself and I encourage you to ask yourself when you see data in the wild, as I'll call it. So what is the data source? Where did it come from? Can we trace it back? Is the data clear and understandable? And this applies to data visualizations as well, graphics. Can you understand it? Do you need an advanced degree to understand it? You need other knowledge uh, before you look at this data. Related to that, what context is provided with the data? I very rarely trust my own interpretation of data that I see with no context. I need to know why it was made. I need to know the purpose of it. I need to know more information. And the more information that's provided, the better. And then, especially when we're thinking about COVID data, I want you to think about when it was created updated because things are changing. So we need to know that this is the most recent information. So related to that, why is data about COVID particularly complicated? So I just mentioned this rapidly changing. We get new pieces of data every day. We get updated numbers, updated reports, and it's messy. So if we think about the data around COVID, it's coming from a variety of sources. So we're taking data that's captured at the local level, at local health departments, local hospitals, and we're trying to aggregate that and bring it up through various reporting agencies, um, for example, the CDC. So it's not perfect, it's not messy. We're collecting data we didn't collect uh, before. I don't know about you, but um, I didn't know any disease hospitalization rates the day after before COVID. So I didn't know um, yesterday how many people were hospitalized because of a heart condition, right? So this is data we're not used to sharing this way and we've, we've adapted over the, the past few months in sharing this data. I also wanna point out that the data we receive about COVID and scientific data in general is always translated for a new audience by the time we consume it. So I don't know how many of you have read um, scholarly scientific articles. Um, I've read a few, they're dense, they're hard to read sometimes unless you have that background. It's scientific information presented for scientists. So there's this whole field called science communication where people take what's coming out in the research and they translate that for new audiences, normally a public audience. So we're having to do this with uh, COVID data very quickly, very rapidly. There's people with a great set of skills around this, but it's hard and sometimes things get lost. All of these complications lead to misinformation that Stephanie so beautifully defined before. This could be because of conjecture, it could be because of manipulation, it could be intentional, it could be completely unintentional. So I wanna look at some data together. So this is a dashboard from Johns Hopkins University. I'm gonna go through this dashboard, but while I do that, I want you to put any thoughts you have about this dashboard in the chat. So if you have any immediate reactions to it, does, um, do you like it, do you not like it? Is there any piece that uh, catches your eye? Anything that elicits a response from you? So um, as you type those in the chat, I'll go through some of the key pieces of information here. So we have global cases. That's a common um, number we get around COVID. We have global deaths, we have deaths recovered, we have some charts. We have a map, we have a lot of different tabs. I'm not doing this justice because it is, um, it's an interactive, interactive chart. We have a global map, US, they have data in motion. Um, let's see what people are saying. Okay, so looks ominous, yeah. Red is alarming. There is a whole lot of red on this map. And red is a color that elicits emotions. And what's in red here? So in red, we can see is global cases are in red. So um, global cases are in red. And yes, it is alarming how many global cases we have. Is red the right color to represent global cases? Should red be reserved for something more extreme like hospitalizations or fatalities? So we have to think about that when we look at data visualizations, what kind of reaction um, is eliciting. 
Jason says, it looks like blood. Yeah, it's a little intimidating. The US looks really bad here. Um, and some people say we wish we could be like Canada. Canada's looking pretty good. Uh, but there's also questions about reporting. So is this, is this accurate? Um, some people are using this dashboard. There's a lot of non-red. Yeah, so there's a lot of questions about this. Another thing I'll point out in this view is everything is total numbers. We don't put those in perspective. So we don't have per capita, we don't have percentages. Is that okay? Is it not okay? I um, also wanna point out the source. It says Johns Hopkins University. Is that something we would trust? Do we think this uh, is a, a good source, Johns Hopkins University? Yes, I see a yes in the, in the chat. Yeah, there are some questions about the, the uh, validity of the data as well. So Johns Hopkins, yeah, I would say Johns Hopkins is a trusted source for me. It's a, it's a research institution, has a reputation for healthcare. One thing to point out is it's the Center for Systems Science and Engineering. So this um, was originally created by a single graduate student in connection with his advisor. And there was a moment early in the pandemic where it got taken down because there were some data issues. So it's, it's a big data project and we have to think about who's creating. They are working with the medical side of Johns Hopkins. So um, I would say this is a trusted source. There's data dashboards like this everywhere. The New York Times has, has one that um, I look at sometimes. CDC has their own local uh, public health sources. So for example, in Rochester, Monroe County has a great uh, dashboard you can refer to. University of Rochester has their own dashboard. So we can use these and we just need to think about them critically. Okay, just a few uh, considerations they, considerations around visualizations and we highlighted most of these already. So colors, they can trigger emotional responses. We need to think about that when we see a visualization. Is there a reason for a lot of red? Is it political? Is it just circumstantial? Is it trying to elicit a response? Is that an appropriate response? Uh, think about comparisons. Is the scale appropriate? Are we looking at comparative numbers? Are we placing the per capita percent percentages? Is 10 cases in a county in Montana the same as 10 cases in Manhattan? Probably not. Uh, we need to look at metadata. What's the source, the date, the context? We need to know why this chart was created. What were the methods? What were the tools? Is it transparent, the motivation behind the creation of the visualization? And do they acknowledge uncertainty? So the data issues some people highlighted in the chat. Are they acknowledging that the data is changing? Are they acknowledging that they don't know everything? And this is the, our best attempt to visualize this information. I'm gonna talk about one more thing for the sake of time. So we have uh, some time left over questions. And I wanna share um, some research that's actually been done around this. Um, so Evan Peck is a great researcher in this area. He's an associate professor at Bucknell University in their computer science department. And he identified something early on um, in the pandemic and his research has revealed this as well, that we tend to view visualizations as objective and data itself as objective. Um, and here's also a link to a really great blog post summarizing some of his recent research, it's very readable. But um, we can take the same information and we can visualize it wild, in wildly different ways. Um, so I'm just gonna share a few of these. So this is the same information visualized in different ways. So we have this chart on the left, A I'll call it, all the same color. Um, this is from March too. So uh, just to, these are not accurate numbers right now. And then B over here, we have some more numbers um, and some more information. So same data, all from the World Health Organization. We're looking at it differently. Same data again, visualized two different ways. Um, we've got some color schemes here, over here. You might notice that China is the only one highlighted here. Does that cause some issues? Uh, does that prompt people to view the visualization in a certain way? This one over here um, might be a bit cluttered, but again, same information, visualized different ways, and we have to think about these visualizations and if they are the best way to present the information and if they are contributing to any bias we may have. So before I stop talking, I wanna remind you that data and visualizations in general, and especially around COVID, are very useful. Don't be afraid of them, use them. It's important that we stay informed about them, but they can be flawed. The data itself can be flawed. It could be politicized. It could be um, not, represented, not representative. It could have things missing. 
And data and visualizations in and of themselves are not objective. We still need to apply that SIF framework. We still need to apply critical thinking to them. Okay, so we, we still have some time, luckily. Um, I want to stop there about data, but I want you to give us some feedback. I want you to share with us in the chat, if you feel comfortable, some um, practical takeaways you will leave this seminar with. So something you think was particularly useful, something uh, we cared a whole lot of information, and I don't expect any of us remembers everything that was said, but if there's one or two things uh, you would like to share that you found particularly useful, please do so in the chat. 